So welcome to week five, which is actually kind of week six, but it's because week zero is the first week and I'm a computer scientist. Um, so week five, the focus is um, no longer on pillars. We went through the four pillars of flipped learning over the last four weeks. And this week is really just a discussion about how do we get started doing our first activities, our first forays or um, dipping our toes into doing flip learning. Here comes Joe Murphy. And we're already recording, Joe, just to let you know as you're jumping in. We just started, actually. Um, welcome. You will be muted automatically when you join my sessions. Um, so yeah, the last four weeks have been about the four pillars of flip learning. And this week, the focus is just on how do you get started doing something flipped? And um, I, I've been struggling, you know, who do I get to come and, and join us each week? And there was a week where we didn't have a guest and um, June is joining us this week. He's been in a couple of sessions um, and he's been joining us from, from, from the Philippines. And Daniela is joining us from Argentina. And Joe is in the US. Benjamin's here in Mexico, but is originally from the US. And Joy is joining us from up in Canada, my uh, birth country. So we're from all over the world today. And I'm really excited that I just kind of said, hey, can anyone join me? And Joe said yes, and Joy said yes, and Benjamin said yes. So I'm really happy that I have all of you here. Um, so I'll probably like stop talking so much. And I, I just want to throw it out to you. What, what do you think are the, the first things to think about? Or how do you get started doing flipping in your classes? And Benjamin was in this course many years ago. That's how we met, actually. I mean, there's the, there's the practical aspect of it, and then there's the talking to admin and getting it cleared aspect of it, right? Yeah. So I think before you even kind of jump in, you need to figure out why you want to do it. Why do you want to flip a course? And you yeah. need to talk to your administrator and say, look, this is what I'm thinking of doing. This is why I want to run it this way because it's very different than a traditional classroom experience. And if you right. get pushback from parents contacting admin saying, my, my student isn't being taught, they're you know, watching videos at home and then not doing things in class, uh, the administrator needs to know how to back you up mm -hmm. right? and, and what's, what, uh, what, what the, your goal is and why that's actually better for the student, right? So right. There, there's that that's aspect of it. It's a great so point. Joy, I might, I, I, I think ahead, those are really good points. I might even back up a step beyond that, which is to think about, um, to think to, that you, I just want to point out that you don't have to think at the course level, um, mm -hmm. that you could think at the, uh, at the lesson level. Uh, and mm -hmm. I've seen actually one of my favorite examples of a flipped class uh, was just somebody who was doing a, a lesson on how to read a social science journal article mm -hmm. and realized I always start with the same 15 minute lecture. That sounds <laughs> like something I could record. And then I'd have 15 minutes more to actually dig into how to reading an article with my student. I said, that's right. a good class. So you could, thinking about scale, whether it's on mm -hmm. the level of the lesson or we've got lots of good examples of people who flips, who start by flipping one day a week. And the rest yeah. of the week looks very traditional, but one day becomes different. So Interesting. giving yourself the flexibility to jump in at a level that's sustainable, I think is probably important. That's a cool point. Yeah, I like that, uh, that idea. I'm, I'm similar uh, to thinking really about flipped learning and to the degree I can implement flipped learning uh, with my students. I think one of the starting points for me is thinking about the course itself and the students and what kind of culture am I dealing with in terms of what students are typically used to in the technologies that they currently already use and the way that they're used to accessing content trying to take that into consideration because I have found in my case where you know, I my courses typically will look differently from the beginning of the semester as it does at the end of the semester in terms of the degree in which I can usually flip uh, the classroom. So there's usually kind of a learning curve uh, where students and I are really adapting together to this new 
in some cases, a new way of, of uh, offering a course. I, at this point, at least it's been my experience that I think if you can have administrators or the support of, from the administrators that also work with you, I think that's great. It's been my experience, however, that they've usually been left out of the equation. Now, I, no, I, I would like to ask you um, something that I've been wondering for a long time, um, which is the question of time, actually. Uh, that is, how do you manage um, to get students uh, do all their extra time, really? Because I have tried, I mean, flipping um, now that we are um, in a special context. And so I reduced the, the synchronous time and so the flipping was, well, so let's say that students still have the same amount of time uh, that's required. But if I picture once we come back to school, um, if my subject, for instance, has four hours a week of face-to-face uh, -face lessons, right? Uh, then how, how do you get your students to use a lot of other time that is extra time into the lesson and then to add time. So we would be adding a lot of time. That's what I mean. How, have you had any problems with that? Go ahead, everybody. I have seen that and, and actually as a course design, it worries me a lot. I mean, it, and it, it does stand to reason that if you make the students work more, they will probably learn more, but it's not really sustainable for everybody or on the course level. So I, I think being very aware and probably being very transparent with the students about whether the workload has increased and how much and in what ways I think is really right. Right. I, I teach at, at university levels, and so I have thought that it might be a good idea then, once we go back to face-to-face -face things, to reduce the face-to-face -face time, maybe into smaller groups. So as to mm -hmm. say, we are. So instead of having a two-hour lesson, you're going to have a 20 minutes lesson only, uh, but in, in smaller groups. And so we are in that way to try and try to balance uh, their time. Yeah. Do you think it's a good idea? I do. And for, for me, my take on it is like if I'm if I take a lecture and I record it, I actually find it, it takes less time to deliver it in a recording than it does in class because you don't have interruptions. You don't have the questions being asked. Yeah. You don't have those pregnant pauses because they can pause a video themselves. That was something that I had to learn how to not do is, is have those mm -hmm. pregnant pauses. Um, so the video itself can be shorter. Now they can take as long as they want to watch it. Right. But that time that they're spending watching it outside of my class time is time they're not spending doing homework since they're bringing that now into the class experience, right? So the questions that they used to scratch their heads about for half an hour and say, I don't get this, that's what we're doing together, right? Mm -hmm. So they might have, have some easy questions to do at home, but I think if you manage it well, you can still have them spend the same kind of like overall time at home and in class as they did before. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily reduce the face-to-face -face time because part of the power of flipping is being able to use that face-to-face -face time for really rich active learning and collaborate. Now, collaboration is difficult right now in COVID times, right? But there are ways to manage it. <laughs> um, but not if, if you can use the motivation oh, that yes, right. they can get the easy right. stuff done and then take the hard stuff and do it together and, and get more into it in class and enjoy it more, hopefully, um, I think that helps to motivate them to actually get the watching done. But if, if they're coming to class and they're finding that they actually don't need that prior material to do what's in class, they're not going to be motivated to do it. Like there's got to be, yes, I need this. And you, got, you have to, yeah, I, I really do need to participate in that ahead of time. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. I think there are a lot of additional questions that go into, uh, Daniela, your, your question, because I think I know I have a lot of teachers that I work with that have the same uh, concern. This is just more work. One of the things that I think about from the beginning is how do I use technologies? How do I have students engage in using the, the content and technologies in a way that is not harder for them, but we're working smarter? That is, we're trying to be as efficient effective and engaging as possible. 
and really using that face-to-face uh, -face time or live session, that, that synchronous time together to get the most out of the experience. So what has to happen before, during, and after those live sessions that I find very valuable? That's my time with them. Now that could be that they're working in groups or it could take on just a, a vast array of uh, possible types of interactions, but how do I get the most out of the time with my students? And then how do I use video or any other materials? And how do I use that material and how do they access the content beforehand? It could also be answering the question, well, what makes more sense? Can they access certain content before class for the first time? Does that make sense? Or maybe in some cases, they access the content at the, for the first time during a live class where I am just there as support for any questions that might happen in the moment, right? And then there's a whole other issue of using video and other content after the class in the form of tutorials or uh, in the case of language learning, learning, having access to conversations that we have in class. And I mean, it's a, it's a good question. It's a complex question. I think it really, and drives at the heart of context and really understanding what the type, what type of course is being offered, what type of students and teachers are all involved in kind of, um, I think the answer is gonna be quite different depending on the, the context. So, so related to that context issue, I wanted to say, Daniela, um, I think this is something I will see at my institution too, which is also a college, um, that one of the things people reported as a positive out of the spring was that our faculty were so worried about our students and our students were you know feeling so disconnected that a lot of people doubled down real hard on office hours or small group tutorials and they're i mean they work they're hugely uh powerful ways of doing education so i can and and i heard a lot of people saying i want to see this level of activity in my office hours again so I can easily see us adopting yeah. uh, some, some models where, uh, maybe, where maybe whole class time diminishes and where, again, I think it's important to be transparent. Yeah, we're going to meet a little less because each and every one of you is going to be in my office multiple times having really deep individual discussions for really deep learning. So I, I, think, I think there's something there. Yeah, and that's something I've been pushing for a long time even pre-COVID, I've made it a practice that I want all of my students to have a session one-on-one -on -one with me three times a semester. Um, and, it, and it does mean, and, I, and I, I understand your point, Daniel. I remember when I, first time I looked at FLIF, I was like, I asked my administration, hey, I'm going to teach all of our teachers how to do flipping, and this is really big, and it's a big deal, and our men said we should be doing this. Can, so can I have an unload so I can do all this? And they're like, no. Uh, crap and I'm pushing back and so my thoughts were it's gonna cost me a lot of time to do something new just like teaching a new class just like teaching in a new school um, and so the way I've thought about these four T's because John Bergman wrote a series of blog posts years ago about the four T's of flipped learning uh, or the four hurdles and he called them the four T's and it was thinking and I love that um, I think it was Joy who said it right at the beginning that you need to be convinced that you want to do flip learning. And that's where the, the first T is, the thinking. But you also need technology. You don't really need it, but it helps uh, for communication purposes. Time is one of the T's and the fourth one is training like this. But the time thing was what it took me a while to get around my head. And it was just a return on investment and cost analysis of I need to find where I can save time so that I can shift where my time goes. And for me, I want to spend more time on the one-on-one -on -one, and I want to spend more time as, you know, John Bergman and Aaron Sams always say, um, in the, how do we get the most useful time at about that valuable resource of our classroom time with our students or our small group time or one-to-one -one time? And, and the real question is, where do we pull that time from? For me, it's, I assign less assignments. So I'm grading a lot less assignments. I mean, all those hours with our red pen or purple or green or whatever, how do we claim some time so that we can spend more of the time where we think it's more useful? And I think that's the thing that took me a year and a half to learn. Um, 
And um, I'm still learning, of course, but I think that's where it is. And it's also about making videos or however you want to do things, right? I mean, your first videos take you three hours to edit a half hour video. But then later, it takes me 32 minutes to produce a 30 minute video, although you shouldn't make 30 minute videos, but I'm just using an example. I mean, I just hit record. I yell at the screen and I record my screen of what I'm doing for my students and then I upload it to YouTube and I don't do any post production half the time because it's good enough. My students appreciate me sharing what I'm doing and I don't stress so much about that my hair looks really crappy like it does now or my voice isn't great or my son's in the background with his keyboard. Um, I think that is a it's a huge time when you start making videos and it takes you three hours to produce a 10 minute video. Yeah, and that, that's sort of the, there's a front load of time when you, when you first start flipping. So I think uh, what Joe said about maybe do it once a week, right? Or maybe choose a unit and start, you know, where you're at. Your first videos, yeah, they're gonna take forever. Um, but if you do them well, <laughs> then you might find that you can reuse those. Or you might find your first ones are really, honestly, I, I love the meme that I saw where it's like, have the courage to suck at something new. Because if you don't start there, you, you, need, you need to start in that place. You're not gonna get better if you don't jump in and try it. So maybe your first video takes you three hours and you feel like you can't reuse it. But the second video will only take you two hours, but then you can reuse it year after year after year. So it's interesting when I assign videos from five years ago to my students and they can see how my hair has changed and how my glasses have changed. And, you know, then I had a second child and I just look completely different. So, you know, you do get, there is a payback of time at some point. So I no longer have to sit down and review my lesson notes to get ready for, to give the lecture the next day, because I'm just going to, here's the lecture, right? It's, it's already done. I've got a clone of me ready to go. And I know what that clone is going to say, and she's going to be consistent with what I told last semester's group. I love clones. Yes. Welcome, Viv. I'm glad you made it. Um, Thank still you. it may not necessarily imply. Yeah, it doesn't imply videos. I, I think any preparation for our classes and and a lot of the discussion Danielle is about doing more asynchronous. Right. And, and doing more asynchronous means I need to, you know, ask my students what they need to be doing before we have this group time together, whether it's reading, selecting readings for them to read, setting up. For example, I experimented using um, Hypothesis uh, this past week with one of my software engineering courses and it blew their brains like they did like, wow, this is so cool. But it took me some time to put together how to show them how to use hypothesis and set up a group for hypothesis and use a new tool. It took me time. Um, and it always takes more time to prepare well. And I'm going to jump back in there, Ken, because it, I, I just talked about the videos, but the in-class time, if you want to have a really good experience with your students in class, that takes time to design, right? And you don't want to do that design over and over and over again. You want to have the freedom to play with something, try it with a group of students, and if you find it works well, now you have a resource that you can reuse, right? So yeah, the video is kind of the way of getting the direct instruction outside of class time, but what it opens up in class can be super powerful, right? Yeah. And then you can collaborate with other people and say, you know, what have you done with your in-class time? And having that collaboration also saves you time. Like why invent everything yourself? That's yeah. why we have the flip community. That's why we have flip class chat. That's why we have the flip learning network, right? Yeah. So talk with others who are doing it in your subject area around the world, and don't reinvent the wheel, right? We don't have enough brain space for that, especially in COVID world. And, and it's, it's I, 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 I know I put it in the chat, but um, John had those four T's and I added a fifth T when I talked to educators about flip learning and it's T for trepidation and fear. And, and, and being okay with the fear that we're gonna screw up. Uh, someone just tweeted the other day. Before what? That, uh, before trepidation, that you have fear, like you, you don't have fear okay. of, of screwing up in class. Someone shared on Twitter, I think it was this morning, that, well, I've got a 90 minute class and I prepared for it and it's either gonna take three hours or 19 minutes. I'm not sure which, it depends on the reaction of my students. And this is the reality when we have a dynamic classroom. We're not in control so much and we're not controlling the pacing. And that's really hard to get our brains around, I think. It was hard for me, for sure. 
and sometimes it bombs. Uh, I'm curious. And, and that's where I, sorry, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Benjamin. I, I just feel I wanted to throw, because I'm, I don't know uh, everyone that well, so I'm, I'm not sure what everyone teaches, but I'm curious uh, how much of the content that you create, let's say videos or, or whatever, how much of it is, uh, do you create? How much of it is already out there that already exists? Curated. How important is it that, that you create it? How much of it depends on the type of course that you happen to be teaching? Thoughts, anybody? And I have an entire unit of grade 11 chemistry that I use curated videos because I found the first time I sent them a video or my class video, I was absent. I, I needed a substitute teacher and I hadn't created videos myself yet. I found videos about, it's a gas laws unit, if anybody does chemistry. And I found that what the teacher was saying in the videos I found was exactly what I would say. So why on earth would I spend time redoing that video, right? If it's, if it's, if he's basically like me, then it's done, right? Just give them the thing and give them a resource. And he, exactly, yes. Uh, everywhere you can gain time is good. I do prefer to make my own because I want them to hear my way of explaining things because that's what I want them to reproduce on, you know, their assignments or their, yeah. their quizzes, whatever. So, and I, and I have a tendency to use a document camera and a handout and fill things in and draw things. So that's, that's how I prefer to do it. But there's certainly a lot of quality resources out there, you know, Ken's saying we should have this open sharing and absolutely. Like if, if you can find somebody who your brain sync, then use it. Yeah. And sometimes it's an issue with units or nomenclature, right? Or, and like Joy says, our students like to hear it from us. Um, and you could do something clever, especially if it's open. And I'm, I'm going to, Benjamin is going to be behind me on this and Joe as well, but, and Viv is, um, if it's a total open license, you could do something radical, like play the clip and talk on top of the clip and intersperse and remix that clip you found and then customize it for your students. And that would be beautiful. Of course, you have to be careful about um, how you're using content that way, but even doing it like a short one minute intro and then they watch the clip and then you could say something after and there's all sorts of things you could do to mix that up a bit i think and it depends on your area i mean if you're doing film studies it's different than chemistry right mm -hmm. yeah I, this year well i teach different things um, i teach technical english i teach general english and i also teach um phonetics and phonology for future teachers so i teach completely different things and, um, and I have done different things um, in trying this kind of flipping this year. And in some cases, when I think general English, well, what I have done is to produce the material myself and then add a number of links where students can say add videos on the same topic, thousands of videos if you are introducing on a present perfect. So I do it myself exactly in the same way as Joy was saying. Uh, I, I have found that, that Zoom is a very good thing to use to record my videos. So what I do is I start a meeting and I start sharing screens and doing things and, and so I, and I record it and I use it as, uh, as a video. And, and then I add links for other things. But uh, when I teach phonetics, then it, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, I, there are also some uh, some videos when it comes, but when it comes to intonation, there are so many theories and things, and so will I. I try just to uh, work on that myself. But I have found that in many cases, um, what I have found more, most useful is to write down. I mean, as if I were speaking, but I write down the lesson as if I were talking to the students, and I insert uh, tracks and audios of my own reading of certain things to exemplify and, and, and then films and different things that I find that, that are good examples of what I'm talking about. And, and that's what I have done. I mean, it's a mixture of things, yeah. Lovely, I like that. I like that. I, I struggle with this one. So, so Benjamin, I'm, uh, I'm in faculty development. Uh, I'm the head of our Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, which means actually my amount of uh, course-based teaching is relatively small. Um, and on the one hand, that means much like 
Joy was talking about and Daniela was talking about, there are, there are times when it's important to me to have presence. And actually in some of our workshops, it's about developing your educator's online presence. So it's important for me to demonstrate some of that. Mm -hmm. um, so there actually is a reason behind my choice to make some of those videos. Um, in other ones, I, I have to say it's based on distrust, which is not a good thing for me. Um, it's based on a fear that if that my faculty won't be able to generalize like in a technology video from somebody else's Moodle install to our Moodle install. Based on the emails I've been getting over the last year, that seems to be decreasingly true. Because um, I'm getting a lot more emails where people are saying, can we do what's in this video? Or I, I found this, you know, plug in, can we have it? So yeah. I think that's, I think I need to get myself to be more trusting and say, I don't need to do this. Somebody already did. Uh, actually, I'm going into a workshop tomorrow where I'm going to say, yeah, I'm not rewriting Google's documentation. It's all really good. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I think there are, uh, that's another kind of area of control where it's really hard to let go of that idea that, but they need to hear it from me so they can be comfortable. Uh, I don't even know if it's let go. It's wait appropriately. It's hard to wait. Yeah. It. I find that with my students too, because, uh, and it's often, and this is why lecturing sucks is we often guess at what it is that our students are going to struggle with in the content of the week or whatever. And we always guess wrong. We always guess wrong. And so a lot of my video creation is um, what happens dynamically in the classroom leads to me noticing, oh, they're really struggling with, I don't know, when to choose to use a while loop or a for loop or whatever it is. And I go, okay, cool. Let me take that. And I'm going to go record a short video after our session. And then they notice that like, holy crap, like an hour after a class, Ken posted this video about this question we had. And that got back to the regular educator thing of, I don't have the answer for you right now, but I'm going to get you the answer right away after class finishes. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's interesting because I have a similar approach, uh, Ken. And, and the reason I ask is I have found in the classes that I teach, and I teach English language learners who have, uh, uh, they've entered into a four-year degree program in English language teaching. So they're going to be, uh, their future teachers. And so, you know, I have found that it's very easy to kind of front load too much information, to provide too much information at the beginning for it to be that useful once we meet face to face. I find that when problems come up and things result from the, the live experience, that later then I will create a, some content that will that they'll refer to after class or outside of class. Then hopefully that will enable them to act, to uh, participate in later classes. That that's kind of the the flow or the progression that I've found most useful for for now is really trying to again going going back to that face to face or the online live sessions. Really trying to get the most out of those sessions and uh, trying to provide content outside of class not so that it looks just like typical homework, but things that they know that they need to do so that they're able to do uh, some dynamic uh, activity in class uh, with me or with their, with their classmates. Jump in, Joy. You said you're going to jump in in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to jump in, and then somebody else jumped in. I said, OK, well. But it's only in yeah. the chat, so let's yeah, yeah. bring it out to the video. Yeah, because I'm not sure if that would actually show up in the recording. No. Uh, so I was just saying that I said at the very beginning, you need to make sure you communicate with your admin team and say, this is yeah. what I'm doing, right? And, exactly. and if a parent comes and says, they're just watching, you know, their Khan Academy videos, and then they're coming to class. Why am I paying teacher, for this? At a and private the teacher school. isn't <laughs> teaching. Well, yeah, we move that. that. Yeah. So it, we it, have that. It, right. If public education is a little different, but yeah, if they're coming to class and the teacher still isn't lecturing, um, then there might be some pushback on that, right? Yeah. So you you need to really balance it with what your admin's expectations would be of that. And so I say you say like, do, do we write our own textbooks? Okay, no, but usually you have a lesson and then right. you have questions from the textbook, right. right? You don't usually just have the students come to class and read the textbook for the class and then leave, right? So there is 
supposed to be some way where we as the professional are sort of right. our students' experience. There's a reason why they're, we don't usually just do online school and have them, you know, plugging away at a computer with a, with a robot, right? There's got to be a reason for there being a human there um, and not just a library of resources. Yeah, but I guess to your point, Joy. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah. Sorry, but isn't the argument, and I ask because I, I don't have this experience, but isn't the argument that uh, teachers aren't do, quote, unquote, Teaching. doing their job isn't the argument really a focus on what the students are doing and what they're mm -hmm. are actually doing that they couldn't do if they were doing if the teachers were teaching, teaching. Uh, traditionally? It, does that argument work in in the real world or or not? It's hard. I mean, I've never had pushback from admin on it, so I because I usually use a mix of like I'm blended, right? I do some lecturing class and some some video stuff. But I could see that you would, you would need to make sure you communicate with your administrator about whether you're teaching. Like, what is teaching? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, the, it's the question. Because I have heard of uh, admin coming to a, a performance appraisal uh, where there's a lab being done, and they say, oh, you're not teaching. I'll, I'll come back to another class. Well, a lab is still teaching. Like, you, if I'm running a science experiment with my class, I've got actually got more to deal with during that lab than I do when I'm standing at the front, you know, doing sit and get kind of stuff, right? So, uh, yeah, you, it, it, you're going to really need to navigate how your relationship with your administrator is and their philosophy of what teaching is and maybe push the envelope a little bit and say, look, like my, my students' um, achievement is going up, their understanding is going up because of these active learning activities that we're doing. You can't tell me that they're not learning. And I, I do worry a little bit that reactions to that are gendered. Um, mm. You know, we, I, I certainly hear from some of my established female colleagues that they get critiques about the teacher, I mean, using too much Socratic method in the classroom. Um, why don't you just tell me the answer? I asked you what the answer was. Why don't you tell me? Um, and honestly, people that look like me get that reaction a lot less. And it's not fair and it's not right, but it's out there. And I think it's, it's, it's a reason to be transparent with students and with parents um, as well to make sure that they understand exactly what everybody just said. And I don't need to repeat that it's about the student learning and understanding that I'm here to assist your, le le your learning, not just to deliver the same lecture I've been delivering for the last 20 years. How much of it has to do with the standard way of assessing if, if that exists in, in your context? Like, and, I'm, and I, I'm thinking in terms of formative assessment, kind of informal alternative forms of assessment, but I'm also looking at or questioning the role of either traditional types of testing or summative types of testing and how that relates to this idea of flipping the classroom and, in, and instruction, because it seems like that would also be a huge factor in how assessment is uh, being implemented uh, both, I guess, within the classroom where teacher the teacher has control versus, and also maybe at the school level where maybe, I don't know if there's exit exams or, or formal exams that are also part of the equation. I'm, I'm curious what your experiences are in that regard, kind of adding to the equation this, this, the idea of different forms of assessment. Well, I think that the, the, the problem does not go into that, at least in my experience in here in, in Buenos Aires. And um, what I can tell you is that it's more difficult to work with students' expectations. And I, I always say 18, um, 18 year olds and, and older. But what the student expects, and, and that could be in a way uh, motivated and encouraged by the system, in which we have been talking about this with Janet couple of times, that is that attendance is kind of the key thing in our system to pass the course. So if you've got a student sitting there in a lesson, even though he might not be doing very well, I mean, if the student is not there, he will never pass the course. Because in our case at university, 75% of attendance is required. So what the student believes is that because he's there, he will pass the course. 
and that he has to be there sitting and you have to be there providing knowledge and while he's there sitting and that would be kind of enough you know and then he has to go and vomit what you've been saying <laughs> in a in a board of exams right and, and that's it so trying to change the student's mind i believe is even more difficult than authority is when you tell students and i repeat this a lot to my students that they should be in charge of what they what they learn that they have to to activate and to um, search for things and for, uh, they have to be aware of what they actually need and what they don't and what they learn and what they don't that they have to stay to learn and not to pass the course that's the difficult part so i think that if now with this uh, pandemic and this online learning if now they realize that attendance is actually not the key i think that will be for me will be the best thing after the COVID. But um, if we change that, if we change the fact that attendance is essential, we will be changing a lot. And I think that's a problem because they believe that because they are there, um, that, that's kind of their role. They have to be there sitting and they have to be at, at the front speed room. And so changing that, once you don't do that, they start talking and say, no, no, they, she's not working. She doesn't do things. We, are, we have to do everything ourselves. And say, yes, that's what you have to do, actually. Yeah. But you have to be doing things yourself and I can guide you, I can help you, I can, I can um, solve problems for you, but, but I cannot be telling you what you have to say. So I think yeah. that that's most, that, that's the biggest problem really. Um, it's a big that. switch. It's a big switch. Well, we, we just made that switch two years ago in our institution and it was, it was hard. Our students weren't used to it, our faculty weren't used to it, our parents weren't used to it and um, it's hard. It's, it's a big big switch. At our university, we used to require uh, students who were taking general English courses and extension courses to take an exam to pass the course. And it was your traditional multiple choice uh, exam that they had to pass. It seems to me if the school is implementing at that level, that type of an assessment that requires students uh, to pass, that that is going to influence hugely the, the way in which a teacher can flip or not flip a classroom. It, se it seems to me like that would be an example of maybe a university implementing a formal way of assessing that would highly influence, I think, the, the way in which flip can be implemented. That's what I'm curious about is there are some ways that we can as teachers uh, adapt certain formative assessments within our, our classes, but sometimes some uh, schools will implement these formal uh, exams that seem to go against really the principles of, of FLIP and then how do you you know bring in that dynamic with, within your day-to-day -day practice. This is taking me back to I remember when I was first introduced to flipping uh, my principal at the time took me and, and a few other people to a couple of schools where flipping was being done and I hadn't heard of it before. So when she said, hey, we're going to go to this school where there's this flipped classroom thing, and I kind of like read a little bit. I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting idea. You know, PD, you know, that's going to waste my time. Okay, fine. And then I saw it in action and I was hooked. And I think, I think a lot of educators have that experience where when they learn about other people using it successfully, we have that transformation. But what I'm now getting curious about, and I just thought about this when, when you're talking earlier, is students still spec the same model that's been going on for the last 100 years. And so when they see us doing this new thing, which really has been going on for at least, you know, at least 10 years now, or, you know, longer, um, in some way, shape or form, they think that it's this weird thing, when really, there's people all over the world flipping classes. So how do we get students to understand that school can be different, right? And it's not just, you know, Mrs. McCourt doing this weird thing over here in her corner, that there are students succeeding better at courses because of this. And that's why other teachers are trying to do these weird things. It's, and maybe it's not weird, right? Yeah, I, I'm seeing in the, in the chat, Ken, yeah, parents as well. How do we get them to see that just because they did okay or not uh, through this particular model, 
you know, if, if a teach, teachers are usually, not always, usually the ones who are good students, right? We succeed at playing the game of school. Uh, if we can change our minds about what school is, then surely we can get others to, but we need to have that exposure to say, hey, here's what's different, right? It's not this one flip school in, you know, in the state. It, it's actually spreading and it's becoming more prevalent. So like I, what Benjamin was talking about reminded me of two things from my own, you know, uh, educational experience before we were using the term flipped. But in, in thinking about those kind of end of degree or end of year or whatever assessments, um, I don't think it's, I think a flipped model might help with that. And like specifically one of the things I was thinking about was in graduate school, I remember I remember having two final exams in graduate school and both professors said, this is dumb, you will not do this again, but to complete this program, you must take an exam based comprehensive exam and I must give you practice on taking that exam. Um, actually, my professors were wrong. I've done a ton of writing to deadline. Now I've done very little quizzing on facts, but I've done a lot of writing to deadline. And actually I think there are there are cases to be made on that. Um, and writing to deadline is something you could do in class. And this is reminding me actually of my AP English class in high school um, that, again, there were whole class days that were devoted to, I'm going to give you a question like you're going to see, and you're going to write on it for the amount of time you'd write on it, because that's a skill you need to get used to doing. And, you know, I, I, I'm kind of curious now whether, you know, I can't, recall, but uh, I wonder whether there were other elements of content that were shifted away to create that active learning opportunity. So, you know, I, I think that there are, again, there are ways to be transparent and ways I would expect students to respond very positively to, like I did in graduate school, when someone said, you have to be able to do this, here's your practice opportunity. Um, that kind of transparency ought, ought to help. I'd like to tell you a story where I could prove that it helped, but I, all I can say is should. That silent pause. Often in flipped classrooms, you have to be comfortable with that silent pause as you wait for a student to answer. Yeah, I brought up the stakeholders there in the, in the chat. That um, we need to think about these stakeholders. That the stakeholders are students and teachers, and and um, as Joy pointed out, administration. Make sure they're looped in in this uh, conversation. And parents are a factor. And something I've learned in Mexico, parents are much more connected to education, even at the university level, um, and how that affects change. I saw that happen with our our sons who were in a different educational model. And they struggled with implementing this different educational model because parents were pushing back on it. Whereas like parents were saying, I'm not seeing enough homework being sent home for my children to do. And the model was not to send any homework home, but the parents were pushing back on the model. And I'm like, but you chose to send your kids to this private school with a model based on Finland education, but you didn't really understand what you were sending them for. So there's all these stakeholders involved in this process and we really need to think about the impact on all of them. And I, of course, was the teacher who's There's in the parent-teacher meetings, which is always problematic to start with. We've all dealt with that. Uh, I'm curious also, I've got another kind of question I would like to propose because you Sure. Uh, you guys have a lot of experience with this. I'm, I'm curious about uh, assessment. If you want to think of it in terms of flipping assessment, but how how do you address that? How much of it is part of your practice in terms of making, especially now that we're most of our classes are online, presumably, and uh, maybe before they were at least some point in person, but how much um, I don't know, it could be in the form of a video or an audio where you're addressing feedback to maybe the whole group or, or maybe a smaller in smaller groups. 
I'm asking because, you know, I have a, a son who's in high school and he's going into classes online for the first time and he's uh, having some problems getting feedback from the teacher. So he'll, they'll assign an exam or some sort of quiz and he gets the results and then naturally he'll have questions. And sometimes there's a lag between the feedback that the students are getting. And so I'm, I'm wondering how you all deal with uh, assessment in terms of a flipped learning uh, classroom and you know how you're offering not just the input or videos outside of class, but also how you deal with assessment if it's during the class, after the class. I saw you open your microphone, Viv. I didn't know oh, if you were going to jump in there. Uh, yeah, but I I think we we went to another topic, <laughs> so I don't want to interrupt the flow of this conversation. Um, I always find that flip and assessment is really kind of orthogonal. Um, it's it's not related directly. Although I think a lot of us that go towards more active learning in a flipped classroom and definitely online, um, we're definitely aiming at more formative assessment and less big summative chunks, which is what I'm trying to preach. Um, but I think it really gets down to having quick feedback. And I think that's online or offline. It's just that I think this in-person contact that teachers are so used to, the students right there as you give them back their quiz, and then they're asking, well, why didn't I get this on, on the quiz? And we're not used to this communication mode, right? Um, and I think a lot of teachers are just struggling with how they're even, you know, showing your grades and learning how to use Moodle and Canvas and Blackboard and all these things. And they're used to be able to like, here's your paper with the numbers on the, on the sheet. And we're really struggling. I know I, I'm seeing this in, in my child's classes as well as um, colleagues that aren't used to using um, these systems and, and students should be able to see at any time how am I doing in the class and of this assignments I didn't get everything perfect why didn't I get everything perfect and and, and that should be obvious and I think we're all struggling with that online um, because I think that's toggle. I think that's uh, the point is that I, I'm wondering if assessment is still kind of an afterthought or are we thinking assessment first before we even think about the, the instruction, and when I say instruction, right. I'm also referring to flipped learning, any type of content, yeah, uh, not delivery. just the live class. So that's my question, that's at the root of my question is really, it seems to me that we have to think about both at the same yeah. time, because if it were, we're changing to a flipped learning environment, it seems to me that that also implies some sort of shift in the way that we assess. Yeah, I, I, it, it sounds like there's actually kind of two pieces to what you're saying, Benjamin. So it's, it's the feedback and the assessment, some people think of it as, you know, separate things. So your formative assessment, I, f I think when you're doing your, your flipping, when you have that face-to-face -face time, it's easier to walk around and have the conversations and say, hey, let me look at that. Oh, you have a question about that. Oh, hey, this is where your, your problem is. But the students aren't processing that as feedback in the same way that they're used to processing a mark as feedback. So there's, they're not seeing um, the value of that, it, that we're seeing the value of that, right? Because suddenly I feel like I, I know my students better than I did when I was waiting for them to give me a quiz and then giving it to them after the fact, because I'm seeing them work on it in real time. Um, but I don't think I'm necessarily designing my end assessments differently at this point. And so I, I need to wrap my mind around that. But I know how some people are giving, like returning things to students is let's say something is um, submitted electronically, like an essay. I don't collect essays because I teach science and math, but, you know, handing an essay, they'll take their LMS and use like a pen and a tablet to mark it up and then return it that way. But I've also heard of people using like voice notes and video notes just to do like a quick five minute here's why you got this on the uh, on this essay and then i just i'm glad i don't teach english or something more essay based <laughs> because I, I think about how many of those you could do with a lab report too though right or yeah. like a, a computer program or whatnot and say this is why you got the mark you did um and you, then you might need to have like common phrases that you go to and say okay this this one applies to you <laughs> so you're not having to 
think of it up on the fly and spend half an hour making a five minute feedback video, right? Um, or make a summary video based on the common mistakes in, right. in your group you can do as well, sure. Yeah. I'm pretty yeah, sure Kate Baker, who joined us last week, uh, talks about doing like video comments on top of essays and such. Mm -hmm. Right, so I, I, what I have done is, um, in some, depending on, on, on the topic of what I've been um, testing, let's say, or assessing, um, I have taken, well, the, the most typical mistakes in general, right, and I have um, organized some kind of PowerPoint or something, and then I recorded myself with Zoom and with that explaining what has happened and why things were wrong in general. Um, but then again, as Joy was saying, I use SoundCloud a lot. Um, and so SoundCloud allows you to uh, listen to uh, students track and to uh, include comments at certain points. Takes time, I have five different accounts because you get blocked in the number of comments that you make. So I have five different accounts uh, when, when it comes to partial tests and things because I've got um, maybe 300 students, so uh, it's a lot to listen to. Uh, but it's good because then the student listens again and sees that all the things popping up as they listen again, and then we are, they, they should understand the final mark because of the, of, the different, um, of the different comments. And another thing that I do is, first of all, for, because it's faster and easier, when tests are written and something is written, what I do is I upload it on, on my Drive account and I share the, the folder to all the students. I say, okay, go and collect your, your, your test. But that allows them at the same time to look at their partner's test. And the same for the, for the SoundCloud uh, accounts. They all share, they, they upload their SoundCloud links on a Padlet. And so I really ask students to, listen to their, their partners' um, exams and what they have to, what they say, how they say it, what comments they get, so that they see uh, different feedback and different partners and different marks, and so that helps too. And Google Documents are great uh, uh, to assess, mm -hmm. give feedback, and your students will comment on your feedback. Is that what you were going to bring in, Viv? You were trying to circle back to the no. earlier conversation. Um, I, I, I think I get lost at some point because <laughs> you were uh, talking about students' expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I read, well, in the context of higher education, I think, and I remember some time ago, uh, George... Siemens wrote, mm -hmm. um, he tweeted, not everybody needs to go to university. Right. Yep. And, I, and I believe that is true. Mm -hmm. Here in Latin America, we have this idea that going to college is about having certain kind of uh, prestige. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have too many students uh, studying college just to get that recognition but yeah. they they really don't like learning or studying or doing this right academic thing why are you so here? they have that um, idea that okay in this level I have to repeat content that my professors uh, tell me so we keep having kids even yep. in this level. yeah it is it's tr it's tricky um, about why are you here I have my own personal story of going to university because it was the next thing and it was the wrong choice and dropped out for two years and then came back. But that's a long story for another conversation. You were gonna, uh, we should wrap up soon, but I wanted Joy to, um, June's adding lots of conversation in the chat here. So maybe Joy could touch on that. 
Yeah, I was going to reach back as he was talking about this spiraling that happens from K-12 curriculum in this country because he's joining us from the Philippines. And we have a certain amount of spiraling in our courses too, but also this idea of prerequisites. Yeah. So when we the shutdown happened in March, there were students taking grade 10 academic math and the last unit is trigonometry. And now those students who couldn't fail the course because they were passing before shutdown started are in my grade 11 yeah. physics and I want them to use the tangent function. So how do I fix that? You know, flipping is a way to say, okay, I, I can't teach you grade 10 math, but I can direct you to the video that I made for my grade 10 math class uh, or one that I curated for that course, right? So they need to fill gaps in prerequisite knowledge right now is a huge thing in a lot of areas, I think, because of how we are affected by COVID in March through June. Yeah, definitely. Well, this has been wonderful. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. I should wrap up here because we're getting on the hour. Um, thank you, June, for joining us remotely. Oh, good. Thanks for putting the camera on. That helps. Uh, don't feel pressured, but you don't have to put the camera on. Um, we're still recording, by the way. Um, Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, thanks, Joe, for coming this first time, and Joy and Benjamin. And thank you, Daniela, for perfect attendance. Uh, uh, attendance came up in the conversation. And uh, <laughs> June as well. I'm glad you're back. You weren't here last week. And, and 100% attendance. She does. 100% mm -hmm. attendance, except when her internet flaked out or something the other day. I, I um, really wanted to um, open my camera this time, but you know, you I got the funky problem. green screen yeah. weirdness going on. It doesn't work for me. The reality is for many of us teaching here. But um, thank you so much for this conversation. And so this week is really about each one of us in different contexts. How can we think about how to apply FLIP within our context? And June brought up the point is a lot of us have different restrictions on what we can do, what we can change. And, and as I've said in so many talks about FLIP learning, you can't do it Ken's way. You can't do it Benjamin's way or Joy's way or Daniela's way or Vivi's way. You've got to find your own way within your context of how you're going to change your classroom. And um, that's really my message for everyone when they're applying FLIP. Yeah, I, I still thinking, uh, how, how can I flip my classroom if I don't have a classroom? I well, there's that. Faculty development. Uh, well, Joe, me, Viv, you've Feels talked before I... on Edge of Coffee, but you're much yeah. in the same environment. Um, or, or, mm -hmm. or flipping professional training. There's there's a lot of people involved in that. Raj Bora, my colleague from Canada, joined us in previous instances of this course talking about how he The thing is that, that my sessions are very personalized. Yeah. So it, it always depends on the... Yeah professor's needs and, <laughs> and but your time with them is limited so how can you get the best okay, use of your yes. time with them and prepare them before they come in mm -hmm. and i think joe could definitely talk to a lot about that because i that. i i spent a lot of time designing the activities mm -hmm. not too much on the content um, phase of, of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know i i find it very difficult um, and partly it's because we've got a faculty development model um, where my faculty are really looking for as much as possible to, to do the learning during the workshop. And, and actually one of the things that I found uh, yes. among, among these people who as Joy rightly pointed out are really good at school. Um, if they haven't done the homework, they won't come to class. <laughs> they, you know, they, they will, they will just say, if I have to, so, so one of our models actually has been, uh, we've kind of, we're doing something you might even think of as a flipped book club. If a book club usually involves doing the reading at home and then coming to have your conversation, we do journal clubs that preserve 10 to 15 minutes to scan the article. And, and we just acknowledge that everybody's very busy and that's the way that kind of professional development can be flipped a little um, mm -hmm. to make sure that people are able to do that. But I, I do feel you that there are, there are things where I'm not confident that the, mm -hmm. the, flipped, the flipped metaphor mm -hmm. is difficult to use when, yes. uh, when you put so much in, 
thought into the activities we're going to do together are. Yeah. Um, it's a, I find it an interesting challenge, but it's it's a very difficult. Yeah. Yep. Especially because there are busy people, and uh, the it, our relationship is not very. For them, it's not a formal thing that I am going to teach them. It's like we just um, go into a meeting and they expect some things yeah. from me, but they are like, "No, you're not. You're not gonna teach me." Yeah, <laughs> you know. That gets back to the same conversation of expectations of our students. It's 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 really tricky because I've been in in faculty professional development sessions and they assigned us readings and I did all the readings, and then they just assume that nobody did the readings and I'm like all pissed off because like I did the readings so why are we going over this slides telling me what was in the readings because I actually did my homework. Um, so yeah, it's tricky, definitely, definitely. Well, I should definitely wrap up here, but thank you everyone. So everyone should be working on that this week. I hope people are posting their blog posts, um, practicing with their videos. Next week is really just really wrap up. So anyone who wants to join us again next week, you're all welcome. And uh, tomorrow for those Spanish speakers, feel free to join us tomorrow for the Spanish version of this same session and we'll see how that goes. So I'm going to sign off on the recording over here on my recording box.